It's my pleasure to welcome today Doug Stone and Sheila Heen, the authors of the new book, Thanks for the Feedback, the Science and the Art of Receiving Feedback Well. Sheila and Doug are lecturers of law at Harvard and founders of the Triad Consulting Group. They authored the classic bestseller, Difficult Conversations, and have now released their latest book, Thanks for the Feedback, the first book to assert that receiving feedback well is a skill that can be taught and refined. We all get feedback, informal, formal, explicit, implicit, in our personal and professional lives every day. Feedback is fundamental. We can't grow without it. Giving and receiving feedback is also central to Google's culture. It's how we're able to make the products that change people's lives and how we're able to help one another grow. Many of us are currently in the process of asking and receiving for feedback now through our per performance review cycle, so this is a timely topic we can all learn more about. Please join me in welcoming Sheila and Doug. Um, thank you, and thank you so much for coming. I'm Sheila, and this is Doug, just in case you need to keep us straight, okay? Um, so as Louise mentioned, um, 15 years ago, we published Difficult Conversations. Um, what were you guys doing 15 years ago? Google like barely existed, right? So you guys have been busy, which raises the question, what the heck have we been doing for the last 15 years? Um, Difficult Conversations came out and pretty quickly started doing well. And over the last 15 years, we have been um, amazed to find what people are doing with it. Um, I was talking to somebody at NASA last week and learned that it has been downloaded onto the International Space Station which is fascinating, but I guess if you're out on a spacewalk, you really want to be getting along with the guy who lets you back in, right? Um, I also met a woman recently who uses it to teach Argentinian tango, which has very subtle signaling, apparently, between the two partners. Um, it's not the melodramatic thing that we see in the movies. Um, and she told me that actually when couples come to her to learn this together, by the end of the first lesson, they are fighting. Like, you know, you're not signaling clearly enough, you're not communicating, well, you're never listened to me, I'm trying to tell you what we're going to do. Um, so she sends them home with difficult conversations. Um, so in addition to, you know, all of the usual graduate school business management applications, um, it's being used, you know, in marriage therapy. Now here's what happens when you have a book that does well. They want you to do another one. They want you to do another one. I'm being coached to walk this way. I'm trying to receive the feedback. Um, and um, they want you to do another one, and they want it to be as close as possible to the original. Because then all the people who like the original will buy the follow-up. So you know they're suggesting, well, you could do difficult conversations at work, and difficult conversations at home, and difficult conversations for chefs, and difficult conversations on the patio. Um, and you know that made sense in the business world, you know, publishing world that we're in. But we really felt like you know we kind of covered that here. We really wrote this to span personal and professional life, and I guess for chefs too. Um, so we really need to learn something new before we can write another book. And that became the question of the hour. What are we learning that's new? Then it became the question of the year, and then the question of the decade. And during this time, what we were actually doing is going around working with um, corporations across all different kinds of industries, um, as well as nonprofits working in ethnic conflict, working with families, et cetera. Um, and the first thing that we do when we work with a group is that we ask them, so what are your hardest conversations? Because we want to be working on the real stuff that they're grappling with to make it realistic and relevant. And we started noticing a pattern, which was that feedback was coming up a lot. To put a finer point on it, feedback showed up on that list 100% of the time across six continents and all different industries. It didn't matter who we were talking to. It didn't matter why they brought us in or what we were talking about. The first thing that would always come up is giving honest feedback. You know, because the receiver, they get defensive, or they get demotivated, or you hurt your relationship. So like, who needs it? But quickly on the heels of that, came up, people would name, well, but receiving feedback that's unfair or it's off base and definitely poorly delivered, like, you know, really in front of everybody else at the meeting or by text, seriously. Um, and so the usual fix for that in organizations is to teach givers how to give. So you get all the managers together and you train them to give it more skillfully and more often and more persistently if it's delivered or if it's resisted. 
Um, and that makes a lot of sense. You know, we teach that stuff too. But eventually it occurred to us that actually, in many cases, it doesn't matter how much power or authority or skill the giver has. The receiver is actually the one who's in charge of what they let in, what sense they make of it, and whether and how they choose to change. Um, and so we started to look at, well, gosh, what's out there for receivers? Because one of the fundamental human challenges in life is figuring out how to learn about yourself. And so what we're going to talk a little bit about this afternoon is what we've learned about the challenges. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a very um, ambivalent relationship to receiving feedback. Like, there are times where I'm working with someone, it's so incredibly helpful, um, I can feel myself improve, I'm getting better at something, um, you've got a mentor that you really trust or a coach, um, it's exhilarating. And then there are other times where I get the offhand criticism from my mother-in-law um, or from a peer who's, you know, clearly the problem is them um, in terms of them being difficult to work with. Um, and p feedback can also be incredibly painful. And there's this funny phenomenon, and I'm curious what your experience has been, that sometimes the things we learn the most from, either about ourselves or that change us the most in life, are the things, our experiences that are most painful. Um, how many people would say, for them, that rings true sometimes? So one of the reasons then, and this is the starting place for us, feedback is hard because we are conflicted about it. And we have really varied experiences with it. Feedback actually sits at the crux of two human needs. Number one is the human need to learn and grow, to achieve mastery, to get better at something. That is hardwired into us, right? It's why we're addicted to those games, right? To get beginning a better score. It's also why we take up hobbies in retirement where you're supposed to be done with learning. It's why people who otherwise seem normal stick with golf because the good round makes you think actually you're getting better at it. Um, but sitting right alongside that is the need to be accepted, respected, loved, to feel safe just the way you are now. And the very fact of feedback often suggests that how you are now isn't quite A-OK. -okay. Um, and so I don't think this tension is going to go away, but it helps us understand why even though we're always told and we sometimes experience feedback as a gift, sometimes it feels more like a colonoscopy, OK? Um, because of this safety question. Um, so what we want to do is just invite you to think about the feedback that you have received. I'm going to turn things over to Doug. So we're going to put you to work a little bit. I'd like you to think of a time in your life when you received feedback that you did not take. And I want you to think of what that feedback was, and then I want you to see if you can identify the reason that you didn't take it. And we'll give you about three minutes, and if you could pair up with someone near you, just quickly share some feedback you didn't take, and then what, what was the reason that you didn't take it? Question? Uh, do what they suggested, take it to heart. You or know, agree with it. So it might have been an evaluation that you didn't agree with. So you're like, I'm not accepting that. So it could either be advice or evaluation. So we'll come back in three minutes, and we'll get a sense of where you're at. So let's just get a quick sense. What, what are some reasons why you didn't take the feedback? Yes? Did, didn't trust the feedbacker. <laughs> You didn't trust the feedbacker. Their, their motivations, right? Like, what's up with it? Why are they giving this to me? A little suspicious. Yeah? Uh, uh, the feedback was given in a very poor manner, um, either aggressively or. Um, aggressively, poor manner. Ag aggressively and like uh, personally. Yeah. Like, uh, so it was a, sort of an attack on you a little bit. Yeah, rather than, so the feedback could have been perfectly adequate if it would have been done, given in the right you know, tone. Yeah. Because people remotely can't hear otherwise. OK. Uh, others, yeah? I just don't think the feedback makes sense. The feedback doesn't make sense. It's wrong, stupid, right? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Other, others. In the back, you guys also have rejected feedback. Yep. I had a competing commitment that I was trying to integrate the feedback with this competing commitment. Yeah, it, so a, you say you have a competing commitment. It may not be sort of what you're working on right now, or it contradicts something else that's important to you. Good. So there's 
lots of reasons that we don't take feedback, right? And often, people like me will stand up in front and say, look, you're supposed to take feedback. It's good for you. You know that. So just get over it and take the feedback. But in fact, we see that there are, there are real reasons. There are real challenges, uh, tensions that we experience when we get feedback. And we have, we have good reasons for not actually taking the feedback sometimes. So the, the first step in being good at taking feedback, and I should say, being good at receiving feedback well doesn't mean that you take the feedback. It means that you engage well with it, that you understand it, and then sort of sort out. So step one in receiving feedback well is knowing your own tendencies when you get it. How do you respond? What are those sort of internal voice thoughts, the, the ways that you get triggered that may get in the way of you engaging well? And you might think, as you reflect on yourself and others, you might think, well, there's got to be a, a billion reasons, a Googleplex, if you will, of reasons <laughs> why, why a person might reject feedback. But in fact, Jill and I have been teaching this material all around the world. And the reasons sort pretty nicely into three different categories. So if you can get a grip on these three categories, then you've got some real insight into typical, typical ways that we hear feedback. So the first category is what we call truth triggers, or the, it's the problem to see the feedback, understand it. This is your comment about uh, it doesn't make sense, right? So how many people would take feedback if you knew it was wrong and stupid? Probably not so much, right? So this, it makes sense to sort feedback for is it good, bad, right, wrong, helpful, stupid. Someone says, you know, you've got to be, you've got to speak up more in the meetings. In that last meeting you were at, you were very quiet. And you're thinking, OK, but I wasn't at that meeting, and my name is not Mike. And so this, is, <laughs> this feedback is just all wrong. So we are very smart to sort for whether the feedback makes sense, whether it seems right and useful. The challenge is that very often we sort before we even know what the feedback means. So we've decided what the feedback means, and we think, OK, nah, I'm going to put it in the reject pile. But we actually don't know yet what it means. And we'll say a little more about that. Or we, we're sort of listening to the feedback through what we call wrong spotting. We're, sort of, we're, we're patrolling for whether it's totally right or not. And if we could find anything wrong with it, that you know, we don't like the tone of voice, maybe the feedback, the content was OK. If we could find anything wrong with it, we might set the whole feedback aside, even and, and there may be, you know, there may be 90% of the feedback that really doesn't make sense for us, but there could be that golden 10% that would actually be quite helpful. So we'll we'll come back to this truth trigger in a moment. Uh, a second category has to do with the relationship. This was your comment about, well, I, you know, I don't trust their motivations. Maybe uh, I'm not sure why are they giving me this feedback, or maybe I don't trust their expertise. There's something about them that makes me a little suspicious. Um, or it could be, do you have, I just need a little glass of water. It could be that uh, you feel uncomfortable by how you're treated by them. Um, you feel, you know, you, you might feel underappreciated by them. Let's say you do someone a favor, you cover for them at work while they're on sick leave. Then they come back, and the first thing they do is they say, well, while you were covering for me, you didn't even finish that project I was working on. You know, that's, that wasn't good. Now, now I'm in a hole. And you're thinking, OK, let's talk about the project, but you're not going to thank me for covering first. First words out of your mouth are criticism. If you feel underappreciated, it's like an automatic feedback defeat button. Like you can't take feedback from someone as you're feeling also underappreciated by them. So their relationship triggers often defeat feedback as well, whether or not the feedback makes sense. And then the third category is what we call identity triggers. We all go through life with a sense of who we are, sense of how we are, and there are ways that we are that matter to us. So you might think of yourself as a fair person or a smart person or hardworking, kind, whatever it is to you. And feedback represents a threat to how you see yourself, or it has the potential to threaten how you see yourself. And here, we end up rejecting the feedback, not even necessarily because we think the feedback is 
wrong or unhelpful. We simply reject it because we're feeling overwhelmed by what that threat might represent. If this feedback is right about me and I take it in, I become flooded. I feel anxious, depressed, overwhelmed, so we set it aside. Um, and people are very differently sensitive around that kind of thing. In fact, there's a statistic where one study showed that people vary up to 3,000% in their ability to recover or the time it takes for them to recover from very challenging feedback. And so some of us are on the more sensitive side of the, of the continuum, and some of us are on the insensitive side of the continuum. Maybe insensitive isn't the right word for that. I, maybe even keeled is better, although if you're on the insensitive side, you're kind of insensitive, so you, you probably don't care what I call you. Um, <laughs> how many of you would say that you're uh, toward the more sensitive side of the spectrum? And how many would say you're more on the more even killed side? One person at Google is even killed. Okay, uh, so a few in both categories. The interesting thing, so one, one of the interesting things is just knowing yourself on that continuum, but also you're giving each other feedback, right? When a person on one side gives feedback to someone on the other side, uh, it's interesting because we all assume more or less that people are like us. And if you tend to be even keeled, you're giving feedback to someone who is uh, more uh, easily triggered. Uh, you might give it very directly because you're thinking that's how I like the feedback. And it might upset them far more than you're aware and vice versa. Someone who's more sensitive might give the feedback in a kind of roundabout way. The person on the other side of the continuum is thinking like, just say it, just tell me, just get to the point. So it can create these interesting mismatches. So this first step though, as we say, is getting to know your own tendencies in the face of feedback. Which of these are being triggered when you get feedback is step one, and then, so now what do we do? How do we handle each of these triggers as we move through the feedback? So we're gonna say a few things about each so I'm going to put up this statement. And I'm going to ask you, let's just brainstorm. So we're in the C. We're, we're talking about now the substance of the feedback, this first trigger. If someone says to you or you say to someone, I don't like the way those pants look on you, what might that mean? What are, what's a range of meanings that someone might have if they say this? You're fat, <laughs> yes, correct. So in fact, it, the person's saying the word pants, but they really mean the word you and <laughs> the word fat, right? Uh, what else might it mean? Those pants are hideous. So maybe it really is about the pants, right? It might have nothing to do with you. It's just those pants. What else? Yeah, sorry. Say it again. Our tastes are different. So it's just my taste versus your taste, right? And you, you had a? I was just saying that the speaker didn't show them properly or didn't pick them out or something. Maybe it's actually, a, it's, you know, the comment is referring back to maybe what the speaker had done before. Ah. Uh, could be about my, so the speaker had some contribution. I didn't pick them out properly for you, so it's a comment about me. Other? When you wear them, it reminds me of my ex, and you're not. <laughs> 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 when you wear them, it reminds me of my ex, and you're nothing like my ex because my ex is so great or so horrible. Horrible. So, so this is like the biggest compliment you could ever give. You, you're, so you are so much better. That you just erase all this. I love you so much is what you're saying, and I hated my ex. OK, so very positive statement. How long do, you, do your relationships tend to last, by the way? Um, <laughs> So, uh, well, so here's the thing. So we have a range from it's about these pants, you know, maybe they're wrinkled or maybe they're to the match of the pants on the person. Could be about just the person, you know, you're out of shape or you've gained weight. Could be about the person's judgment. It's a comment on your ability to function as an adult and dress yourself. Uh, it could be about a whole range of things. And when we give or receive feedback. Very often, we're using words that are actually, all of those are single syllable words. Uh, they're easy words to understand, and we all think, well, this has a common meaning. But in fact, it's not clear. And feedback very often is very labely. I'll, 
let's take a look at just some of the things that we've heard. I don't like the way these particular pants look on you. Oh, actually, in different light, they look fine. So that's the most specific. Maybe these kinds of pants getting broader. So now it's more about you. You're not as fit anymore. You've never had any taste. And I'm trying to save you from yourself. <laughs> this next one, uh, you know, I, I'm humiliated to be seen around you. And you don't seem to care. So it's about both of us, but you being inconsiderate. And then the really sad one. <laughs> it could be easing, easing into a divorce. So it could have a range of meanings. Um, and this is genuinely representative of the way we tend to give feedback or the way we get it. It tends to come in what Jill and I call labels, these very general terms. Um, and people are well-intentioned, but neither there may not be a common understanding. So for example, someone's, yes? Are these the range in which we take feedback, or the people give feedback, or both? So the question is, is this the range that we take feedback when we're receiving, or that we give feedback when we're giving? Yeah, the answer is both, that we don't know, we don't know what the person means, that the, the giver doesn't, uh, the giver knows what the giver means, and then the receiver might come up with a meaning that might or might not match that. So the receiver might walk around all day and all week and all year thinking, you know, we've got this terrible problem in our relationship, and the giver is, is thinking, you know, those aren't the best pants for the party we're about to go to. And so there's just a vast mismatch. So in, in the workplace, we get feedback that is very labely as well. So someone says, be more assertive or speak up in the meeting. Well, what do these things mean? We, Sheila and I did a radio uh, interview the other day where the guy was commenting on a label that he'd been given. And the, his producer said, you know, you've really got to be more edgy on the radio. You've got to have an edgier persona. And the host of the show was walking around for weeks thinking, like, how can I be more edgy? Like, you know, I got to pepper my comments with, with swear words. And maybe I should talk about sex. Or maybe I should, like, attack people and get some real stuff going here. And he was going, he finally decided, you know, that's just not my persona. It's not who I am. So he's going to talk to his producer. And he's saying, it's really not who I am. And he said, and then he realized, but I, I actually don't understand exactly what you mean when you say edgy. So he said, what did you mean, by the way? And the producer said, well, by ed you know, edgier, you've got to be more sort of emotionally open and vulnerable on your show. <laughs> you know, people like vulnerability. And so there was this huge misunderstanding. And that, it's not that there's a right or wrong. It's that one person has an idea in their head. They're trying to help it, the other person understand that, and it's not, it's not clear. So the, the advice, the question is, so how do you dig under these labels and understand them? And we recommend two, two very powerful, useful questions. Your feedback has a, has a past, and your feedback has a future. So we have the label in the middle. Look back and say to the person who's giving you the feedback, you know, when you say I should be more assertive, looking back, what, what are you referring to in terms of my behavior or attitude, describe to me what sort of provoked the feedback. What, did you, what do you see? And then looking forward, how would I do it differently? What would be an example of how I do this differently? What is it, what does being assertive look like to you as you're, as you're giving me this feedback? So this truth trigger, the, the, the goal of seeing the feedback, um, is really a matter of spotting these labels, digging under them, once you understand the feedback, doesn't mean you therefore always take it. But now that you understand it, you're in a really good position to figure out what does it mean and should I take it? Or are there aspects of it that I should take or not? Let me turn it over to Sheila. So, so far, Doug has been talking about truth triggers or the challenge to see. The challenge to see what in the world is the giver talking about and what exactly are they suggesting and to understand that before you decide, you know, do I think this is good advice or not? Um, and you know, as Doug said, 90% of it might be off, but 10% might give you something to think about. Um, the other part of the challenge to see is the challenge to see yourself. So we have a chapter about blind spots. Um, I don't actually have blind spots, but I know that all of you do, right? Um, and you know, there's all this information other people have about you that you don't have about yourself. Um, and so that's another piece of the challenge to see. I'm going to step over into the challenge of we. 
um, the who the giver is in our relationship, which actually taints the what of what they're trying to tell me. By the way, when you're writing a book, um, you're trying to figure out, well, in what order do we tell this story? See, we, me is the order that we finally settled on. We considered we, see, me, which had nice resonance for um, feedback receiving. Um, the only one we knew was not going to work was see, me, we, <laughs> which really was not going to be appealing. Um, so I'm going to step into we, the challenge of we, or the relationship. Um, and I want to focus specifically on situations where the feedback is actually coming from the relationship. Um, and the other person feels like something isn't working here. You're kind of driving me crazy, and it's probably mutual. Um, and so to fix this, you're the one who needs to change. right? So it's not, I'm going to help you with your skills in a foreign language. I'm going to get better at tennis. It's actually, I'm going to help you not annoy me as much as you do, or to change something, because it's frustrating to me, and I think we could work better together. The easiest way to understand this, I think, is just through an example. Um, so a few years ago, I got a call from a CEO. Um, and he said, you know, I've got these eight senior vice presidents. They each run a function. As a team, they can't stand each other. They drive each other crazy. They can't make good decisions. They all come to me to complain about each other. So I need you to fix them. OK, so there's a whole other set of conversations with him that we need to have. But let's talk about the team for a moment. The first thing I do is I do individual interviews with each member of the team to understand from your perspective what's going on. Um, and what I find here is something that is common in teams that are struggling to work together, which is that you actually have a couple of primary conflicts between individuals that everybody else is trying to work around or manage right, or line up around. Um, and on this particular team, one of the key conflicts is between a guy I'm going to call Sam and a guy I'll call Pete to protect the guilty. Do we want this over here? Yeah. Where do you want it, Michael? That good? All right. Guy I call Sam and a guy I'll call Pete. Um, now, Sam, by the way, is one of these no filter people. Like, whatever comes into his head, he says. You know, people like that? Yeah. OK. So, when I first talked to Sam um, the first time, actually, he answered the phone not by saying hello. He answered the phone by saying, You're seven minutes late. I said, Nice to meet you. Let's use our last 23 minutes well, shall we? And he said, Well, look, it's a waste of time anyway. The CEO is making us come to this two day thing with you. But the real problem here is that these other guys, and especially Pete, can't handle conflict. If I got a problem with you, I'll just tell you. We'll debate it out. We'll figure it out. We'll go out for a beer afterwards. But Sheila, you're not going to change their personalities. And that's why this is a waste of time. And he hung up. Eventually, I get a hold of Pete. Um, now, Pete tells me right off the bat, I hate conflict. In fact, the CEO is making us come to this two day thing with you. Frankly, I'm just hoping to have my heart attack in the first hour. <laughs> like, it is going to kill me one way or another. The question is just how much suffering will be involved, right? I'd hate to have it in the last hour. Um, so Sam is the head of operations. Just to make this more fun, operations used to be Pete's job. Pete moved over and took over international. Why? Well, partly because it's the growth engine for the organization, but also he admits to me so that he can be out of the country most of the time and not deal with Sam. Now, um, you tell me there's a problem between operations and international, oh, every few days. Who starts the conversation? Sam, you betcha. So Sam calls Pete. What does Pete do? Yeah, he does not answer the phone. From Pete's point of view, caller ID is the best invention ever. Okay, So he lets it go to voicemail. What does Sam do next? He leaves a voicemail, and then he emails him. Now, Pete sees Sam's name show up in his inbox, which causes him instant anxiety. Right? Um, he's already triggered. Um, and so he's in the middle of something else. He doesn't have time to deal with this right now, so he lets it sit. Uh, what's the next thing Sam does? Emails him again, texts him, right? Pete ignores it for now. Um, eventually, Sam calls Pete's right hand guy who texts Pete and says, Sam's looking for you. Pete texts back, I know, right? Um, and then eventually, Sam goes above Pete to Pete's boss, to the CEO. Um, now, by the way, about four minutes has elapsed <laughs> here. Um, how many of you are more sympathetic to Sam? In other words, Pete being this unresponsive is just unprofessional. More sympathetic to Sam. 
How many people are more sympathetic, sorry, Sam, more sympathetic to Pete? You have a Sam in your life, they drive you totally nuts. Yeah? OK. Are they both contributing to this problem? Yeah. So by the way, on your team, as you watch things like this, you often will be more sympathetic to one side or the other just based on your own profile. But this is what we call a self-reinforcing relationship system. And each of them has feedback for the other about what's wrong with you that makes you impossible to work with, right? Um, and coaching. We call it a self-reinforcing cycle, relationship cycle or system, um, because their emotional coping strategies are actually making it worse. They're eliciting exactly the behavior they don't like. In other words, the more Sam pursues, the more Pete avoids. And the more Pete avoids, the more aggressively Sam pursues, which means the more Pete flees. Um, Pete actually admitted to me that he was in Afghanistan once on a satellite phone, um, and it didn't have caller ID, so he answered. Sam launches into, you know, this is what we have to do, and you need to make a decision, and blah, 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 blah. And he was so overwhelmed, he just was like, oh, we're breaking up, sorry, and hung up on him. <laughs> um, now, can this change? We're not going to change their personalities, but I don't think when we talk about feedback and coaching, you have to change people's personalities. There are very specific behaviors that are actually making it worse. Now, the place where we finally got some traction on this um, was a moment where it's, it was like the afternoon of the first day of this dreaded two days together. Um, and we had kicked the CEO out. It was just the eight senior vice presidents. And Sam turns to Pete and says, Pete, I just don't understand why, when I tell you you're full of shit, you think I'm attacking you. <laughs> Excuse my language. Now, of course, it's exactly what Pete hates, so Pete's like speechless. And it took another member of the team to say, like, OK, Sam, I know that that would not feel like an attack to you. To you, that's a healthy you know, invitation to a good conversation. That doesn't really feel that way to Pete and, by the way, a couple of others of us. Um, and they started to map this cycle. Um, so that they could see the ways in which actually their coping strategies were inadvertently making it worse. Um, and then what we did, feedback-wise, is we just reversed these arrows. So we asked Pete, look, give Sam some advice. If he needs a response from you, what should he do? Tell him one thing to do. Um, and Pete said, oh, that's easy. First of all, don't call me. When you call me, you already know what the issue is, and you've got your arguments ready. Um, and so I have to pick up the phone cold and want, you know, get barraged with this assault of arguments about a problem I didn't even know existed in many cases. Instead, send me an email. In the email, tell me what's the problem. If you have a preferred solution, just tell me what it is. And especially tell me by when do we have to figure this out, because everything is a crisis with you. And I've got you know, a ton of things on my plate. I've got to prioritize. So tell me. We've got to figure this out by tomorrow morning or by Friday, whatever it is. Then I can prioritize and take you seriously. Sam said, OK, I can do that. So then we asked Sam, all right, what advice, what feedback or coaching do you have for Pete if he wants you to just back off? right? And so Sam said, well, that's easy. Just tell me you got the email. Tell me, got it, because some of my anxieties, I can't tell if I'm getting through to you. I'm an operations guy. I have a problem to solve. If you tell me I got it, and you tell me when you're going to get back to me, I can relax. I'll put it on my calendar. I know we're going to talk tomorrow morning at 8. Then I can move on. All right, did this help? Yeah, for a while, right? <laughs> Because by the way, when you talk about, like they were totally persuaded by this coaching from the other, putting it into action, such a critical next step, and being consistent about that action is a real challenge. And they needed other members of their team. They needed other members of their team to nudge them. They also needed to give each other some leeway. So if they forgot to, rather than say, yeah, see, this just proves you're impossible, um, to nudge, to say, hey, I can't tell whether you got my email. Be sure to get back to me. Um, you know, or I saw you left me a voicemail, can you just be sure to send me an email to follow up and I'll let you know when to, I can get to it. Um, when you look at relationships where you have friction, one of the chapters in the book talks about how do you step back to understand what's going on, why you're driving each other crazy, and what coaching might help. Um, and we really recommend taking three steps back. 
So the first step just looks at what we call you plus me intersections, the ways in which you and I are different, which are creating the friction between us. This, by the way, is why some of your most valuable feedback or coaching can come from people that you actually have difficulty working with. If you only ask the people you work with easily, they sometimes don't see your edges, right? Because it's just an easy complementariness. You know, you have, have kind of the same work style or email management style, when we'll get back to each other, et cetera. The people you find difficult to work with, they see your edges, partly because they're so good at provoking them, right? So they're actually, in some ways, a most valuable player to coach you on one thing that would actually help to make the relationship easier with less transaction cost. And it comes from that di whatever the difference is between you. The second step back then looks at roles. Because sometimes the role we're in in the organization is part of the friction. Like, I have to pester you about this. But in your role, this is not top priority, which is why it always gets slips down the priority list. So some of it is just the roles that we're in that is creating some of the friction. And then, of course, um, the bigger picture, stepping back to say, well, there are, are there other players or processes or physical environment that are contributing to the problem um, that we can or can't change? I mean, one of the dilemmas between Sam and Pete is that Pete is on the other side of the world a lot of the time. So Sam is like, why aren't you getting back to me? Well, because I'm sleeping. OK? So factoring in and stepping back to say, OK, let me just remember that we are constrained by some things so that we can sort of monitor our expectations or make changes if, we, if there are changes that can be made. So this is part of the challenge of we. And how to, I think, getting feedback about the product that you're working on is easier than getting feedback about the person that you are or your management style or your work style. And that's always going to provoke more reaction. Um, especially if the relationship with the giver um, is a little bit troubled or frustrated. Let me just now spend a couple of minutes in the challenge of being me. So one of the things that's been really interesting as we've been working on this project, looking at both the social science and the neuroscience out there, um, is, as Doug mentioned, that each of us is wired very differently in terms of sensitivity to feedback. And we took a look at three key variables that drive your reactivity or sensitivity to feedback. The first is what's called baseline. And in the literature, this is sometimes called set point. The idea here is that you, if it's a scale of 1 to 10, each of us generally gravitate back to a particular level of happiness or satisfaction in life. Um, so some people live their life at 9. They're like incredibly cheerful and happy about everything, like irrationally happy about that great cup of coffee that they had this morning. Um, other people live their life at two. They're just always a little chronically dissatisfied. Now, why does this matter? Oh, by the way, this comes from studies of people who win the lottery. And a year later, they're about as happy or unhappy as they were before. Also, people who go to jail. A year later, they're about as happy or unhappy as they were before. Okay, So this is sort of where you gravitate back for in the absence of other events. Um, one of the reasons baseline is important is that if you do have a relatively low baseline, like you're a 2 or a 3, positive feedback can sometimes be muffled for you. You won't hear positive feedback as clearly. Um, if you have a high baseline, you will hear negative feedback. And that's partly because positive information in life and negative or threatening information in life, um, our system just is wired differently. We have a threat alert system. So negative feedback is more likely to have like a main line to your soul. And positive feedback doesn't have that as direct a connection emotionally, interestingly. The second factor um, is what we call swing. So in the wake of positive or negative feedback, how far do you swing negative or positive? Your team gets the same piece of feedback. I'm devastated. You're like, eh, no big deal. We'll fix it. right? Which prompts you, by the way, to give me additional feedback that I'm overreacting. Right? I mean, I need to get a thicker skin or not take it personally. Um, so I'm swinging wide. And then the third factor is how long does it take to either recover from negative feedback or how long do you sustain positive feedback? So let's imagine you get an email from someone with positive feedback, like, wow, that was fantastic. How many people say you have a pretty long sustain? Like emotionally, that would stick with you for at least the rest of the day, if not the rest of the week. How many people it would stick with you like until you open the next email? OK, so <laughs> this is really different. 
And by the way, sustain and recovery, as well as your degree of swing, positive and negative, operate independently. So you can have long sustain, but quick recovery, for instance. Or you can have short sustain and very long recovery. If you have short sustain and pretty long recovery, feedback is really threatening. Because the positive stuff just doesn't stick, no matter how genuine or important it is. And the negative stuff really takes you a long time to recover from. Um, you know, and vice versa, if you have the opposite, actually feedback's pretty great. Because the positive stuff sticks, and you don't necessarily remember a whole lot of the negative stuff. By the way, Doug mentioned, obviously being very sensitive to feedback is challenging. But being insensitive or even keel in the face of feedback has its own challenges, because sometimes it just won't stick with you. And so then you go back and you have another meeting, and the person you're working with says, remember we talked about this six months ago? And you're like, oh, yeah, we kind of did, didn't we? Because your uh, emotion, the degree of emotion you have in the experience affects how you remember it and how easily you can retrieve it. It puts like a big red tag on it so that you can retrieve it easily. Um, and in retrieving it, if there's emotion associated with it, you can re-trigger that emotion. So you feel terrible or anxious or whatever again when you remember it. Um, so if you don't have a lot of swing, you, it may not stick with you. OK. Um, one more thing about why it matters, how sensitive you are. If you are in the depths of a big negative swing, really upset by feedback, it changes your sense of the feedback itself. So it changes both your sense of the feedback, it gets supersized, um, and your sense of who you are. Um, and one of the things that happens is what we have dubbed the Google bias. Because it is as if you get one little piece of feedback, it's discreet. Do people know what Google is, the <laughs> search engine? And it's as if mentally and emotionally you actually Google everything that is wrong with me. <laughs> okay, And you get 1.2 million hits. There's sponsored ads from your father <laughs> and your ex. Okay. And suddenly, you can do nothing right. Your sense of yourself, as well as how important this is, changes. And we call it a bias because, of course, as you guys know, what you get hinges on your search term. So you are not searching things I'm handling pretty well. If you did, you'd get 5.2 million hits, and you would have a more balanced sense of yourself. So one of the chapters of the book is how do you dismantle these distortions so that you can actually see the feedback at actual size and use it to learn something and not have it overwhelm you. Because when you're overwhelmed, it affects your sense of the past, your sense of the present, and your sense of the future, and can disable your ability to learn from it, to learn anything from it. Um, I want to turn it over to you. You want to say a couple words about that? And then we're going to take yeah. questions. So just a final thought from me. So Sheila tends to be more even keeled on this spectrum, and I tend to be more sensitive. And you know, in many ways, that made for a good team writing the book. We had sort of a representative of different types working on the book. Uh, but for me, it was a little bit of a personal journey as well, where I, I before I wrote the book, I had I experienced feedback as very challenging, as, obviously, especially negative feedback, and I would get upset or disappointed and anxious. Um, now, having written the book and thought about this stuff uh, a lot, when I get negative feedback, um, I get disappointed, upset, and anxious still. <laughs> um, so what does this mean? So uh, um, one thing it means is there's, there's, there's nothing that turns bad news into good news or negative feedback into positive feedback. But there's a big however to this. It, you know, it would be nice if I could report that now I'm just this learning machine, and I go and seek feedback, and, and nothing ever throws me off. Um, but I still do get triggered by things. I still do get upset by things. But the good news is also really important, which is that I get significantly less upset, and I get back on my feet. I, get, I find my balance much more quickly. I feel like I have specific tools um, that enable me to do that. Uh, so the result of that, the result of now being somewhat uh, more resilient in the face of feedback, is that I'm able to seek it out more often. Uh, and both at work, so at work when you seek out feedback, you do improve and get better. And then also in personal relationships, 
when you're somebody who sort of puts up a wall to feedback, it limits sort of your own learning in the relationship, but it has a particularly high price tag for the person you're in a relationship with because they're inevitably going to have some challenges with you that they need to talk about. And if you can't talk about them, uh, it, it makes it really tough. And it, it, you end up being isolated within the relationship. So as I've gotten better at feedback, it also has the uh, amazingly useful benefit of making you better, not just at work, but also in relationships. Uh, so let's pause here and let's take questions. Uh, yeah, so do we have a mic? Do we need a mic? Yeah. Wow, Placed. that was crazy. <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much for coming. I really like you talk about there are different dimensions, like the baseline, uh, swing, sustain, and recovery. It's really good to know that people are different, and I'm different from anyone else. Yeah. yeah. But I will be very curious to know whether there's like a questionnaire or like a quiz that I can know what like quadrant I fall into, because it's good to know this, but I don't know like what is my own standard compared to other people. Yeah, so, so this research is actually pulling from several different researchers. So there isn't one researcher that has a questionnaire that covers all the aspects of this. Um, Richard Davidson has a book called uh, The Emotional Life of Your Brain that's really interesting and, and is worth reading. And he looks at the fact that positive feeling and negative feeling is processed on different sides. And he has a couple of questionnaires that are more about life um, than about work and feedback specifically, how you respond to events in life that may be helpful. Um, but he also says, check your answers against people who know you. Right. Okay, because you may think, actually, I'm not still upset about that guy who cut me off on the road or you know what happened at the meeting this morning. Other people around you can tell it's still affecting the way that you are interacting with everybody else, um, but you're not necessarily self-aware of that. Um, when you ask other people, it's one of the reasons why we need other people to see ourselves. Um, when you ask other people for feedback, and, and I know that you guys have been talking about not just waiting for performance management official conversations, but actually taking up responsibility to drive and accelerate your own learning. One way to do that is not to go to people and say, hey, do you have any feedback for me? That's a terrible question. I mean, nobody knows how to answer that question, I think, and it's not clear how honest you want them to be. Um, instead, what we suggest is ask for one thing. So say, hey, what's one thing I'm doing or maybe failing to do that's getting in my own way or that's getting in the way on the team? Or ask, what's one thing I could change that would make the biggest difference? You'll get something that's very specific and more concrete, and, it, and it's clear that you want them to be honest with you. Um, and you know that question can help you in a bunch of different relationships um, and give you one thing to work on at a time. So I'm still kind of hung up on you know when I receive feedback about um, what I tend to think is a personality trait of myself, yes. right? Like oh you know maybe you know maybe you should uh, think before you speak and you know like <laughs> like that type of stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> personality trait of not thinking. Yeah, no, 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 no. But like, you know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. oh, you need to be a better listener and, and all these things right. that, um, that I think uh, I can work on, but my personality just kind of yeah. um, puts, me, you know, puts me kind of on one side of the scale. Yeah. Um, how, do, how do you take feedback that you think is just personal to yourself? Yeah. Like, so, like I, I, I don't know how much people can actually change. Well, so there are limits. I mean, to take a, a really obvious example, if someone says, you know, you're, you're, you got to work on how tall you are. You're too tall or you're too yeah, short. Yeah, you're, I'm sitting down. There, That's pretty impressive. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there are things we literally can't change. Then there are things that are easy, comparatively easy to change, like when you get to work or where you work from or whatever. And then there are things in the middle that are kind of a mix of personality tendencies and behaviors and actions. Um, one thing is, is just to, get, to ask very specifically, so what, how would I do that? Or what does that look and sound like when you say I need to be more this way? What does that sound like? But something you might try is what we call small experiments. So sometimes if someone says, gee, you need to be uh, more outgoing at work and more you know, friendlier, and you're thinking, oh my god, I have to change my whole personality. I'm going to be working at Google for the next 40 years, and I was, I've lived my whole life this way, and now I have to be a totally different way. It can feel overwhelming, right? Uh, but if you just think about it, okay, tomorrow, 
what's a little, what's one thing I could try tomorrow? And I, if I don't like the way it feels, then I don't have to keep doing it. But if I like it, then maybe I will keep doing it. So think of it as very specific, segmented, just try it. If you get some positive feedback, you can keep doing it. If you don't and it doesn't feel comfortable, you can find another way in. Yeah, modify it. Um, one of the things in the, toward the back of the book, we have <clears throat> five ideas to get started. And there's also a whole chapter on boundaries, how to turn away feedback. Because being a good feedback receiver also means knowing how and when you need to protect yourself if it's a relentless criticism that's undermining your sense of self. Um, how do you put up some boundaries to say, you know what, I'm, I don't know if I could take that feedback, but it's certainly not something that I'm going to put that much energy in right now. Um, and then how do you talk to the person about that if they're an important person in your life? Um, and then how do you also mitigate the effect? Because just saying, well, too bad, I'm not going to change, um, is OK in some cases, but not in others. So then how do we work around the fact that I leave my purse and wallet and credit cards behind most of the time? It's a personality trait I've worked on for many, many, many decades now. Um, it's so far, no progress, <laughs> right? But I am doing small experiments, right? Trying to be more organized, stopping to check before I walk out of a building. Stapling your credit card. To Stapling your my credit card, yeah, to my sleeve. Hi. Um, I guess it's a question about that same sense of time. You said for Sam and Pete it worked for a while. Yeah. So how do you have that? How do you have yeah. that upkeep without saying that you don't have faith that they're keeping it up themselves? Well, I so know. Feedback in general, by the way, is a. Uh, sometimes we think of it as like, well, that's the thing that happens at the end of the year, and I get my evaluation, and that's my feedback conversation. So if if I have feedback for someone, I it might be. March, but I'll give it to them in November or December during feedback learning time. <laughs> um, and there's a way in which that makes sense. Our evaluations come at a certain time of year, uh, and that's, that, that, that's useful. But other kinds of feedback, the kind of feedback that we would call coaching, should happen in real time. If you're, if you're at, a, at a stoplight and the person in front of you is uh, not going and the light has now turned green, you wouldn't say to yourself, well, I'll wait till December and I'll honk you know, during honking season. <laughs> you would honk now because this is when it's happening. So when you have feedback for someone or you'd like to learn something or receive feedback, if it's, if it's coaching, just do it now. And in, in, in context like this, it's always an ongoing thing. It's not a, we had the conversation once or we had to have a reinforcement conversation. It's going to be an ever shifting. Yeah, and, and it worked for a while where they were very consistent about it, and then they would fall off the wagon, et cetera. So the, the improvement is more like this than like this. Um, and they needed to expect that, um, expect that you, we were going to have to keep coaching each other and keep working pretty hard at it. Um, we'll close, by the way, because I'm getting the time signal. The hook is coming out. Um, we'll close just with one last piece of um, research information that may be useful to you, which is that the, what the studies show is that people who seek out negative feedback at work and in the literature, what they mean by negative feedback is that you're not just going around fishing for compliments. You're actually asking, what could I improve? Um, those people adapt more quickly to new roles. They report higher satisfaction. And they get higher performance reviews. And so it, it's not just that you elicit learning that accelerates your own learning curve. It's also that asking for coaching changes the way other people see you. Um, and so it can be a powerful tool to have in your toolbox, and then you don't have to wait around for the perfect giver. Because mostly our lives are populated by everybody else. So we got to learn how to learn something from all kinds of givers who sometimes are off base, unfair, they deliver it poorly, and yet we're going to find something valuable in it. Um, we're happy to stick around to answer questions, et cetera. Um, you guys have an amazing deal over here by the book. We're asking, like, can we buy some of those books? Like, that's a better price than we get. Um, thank you so much for coming, and good luck. <laughs>